Hello, welcome to the first audio lecture on modern art. In the early 20th century, art moved ever further away from representation and artists began to explore new ways of expressing themselves. In this first module on modern art, we're going to look at some of the art of the first half of this century. As we learn the motivation and the influences of these artists, then the work can take on a deeper meaning. Sometimes this modern art is a little bit harder to understand because it's not as representational. But my feeling is that the more you learn about the art and at the motivation behind it, perhaps you will learn to appreciate it more. And this is such a broad topic, we're only really going to skin the surface, but we will look at some of the main influences of this time. This painting to the left is by the artist Georgia O'Keeffe, and there's a film on her in this week's uh, videos. She painted this picture of her favorite tree after laying under its branches for several evenings. She would go and lay on a bench and just stare up into this tree, and then she painted this picture. She says this painting can be hung in any direction. So we're seeing it now with the trunk coming out of the lower left corner, but you could move it and hang it any way on a wall and it would be okay with her. It would be appropriate. Georgia O'Keeffe is a wonderful example of an artist whose work lies somewhere between representation and abstraction. And she was also a great revolutionary because she was a woman in what was pretty much a man's world at the time. So let's look a little bit at architecture before we go further into the visual art. Oh, look at these two big buildings. They look kind of ordinary, except for that they're the first ones of their kind. The airplane, the automobile, the telephone, electricity, motion pictures, and many other advances were developed in the early 20th century. Now, one of the inventions that really made these tall buildings possible was the elevator, which was invented in 1857. Now, another invention that made them much more uh, comfortable that came along a few years later was air conditioning. So, the very first modern skyscraper was built by the architect Lewis Sullivan. Now, uh, grab your paper, write this down. Lewis Sullivan developed the technique of making steel frames covered in masonry, which led to the modern skyscraper. So, if you think about this, he's making a steel skeleton, and he's covering it with stone, with brick, and that led to the modern skyscraper as we know it today. This building on the right, uh, built in 1891, is considered the first modern skyscraper. Now, if someone were to ask you who designed and built the first modern skyscraper, you would probably want to say Lewis Sullivan. All right? Now, the building on the left is kind of cool because it's the first one to use these large display windows. You know, like if you're walking in front of a department store and they have those big windows. Well, that had to start sometime. And it's built, uh, it was in Chicago, built in 1904. Now let's look at a building that's affectionately called the ice cream cone. Now, it's not really ice cream cone, it's actually stone and cement. I believe there's some granite. Um, it's cut stone, right. So this is an example of Art Nouveau which was developing in Europe at the same time period as Lewis Sullivan was making his skyscraper. So in contrast to the streamlined look of American architecture, Art Nouveau style is based on linear patterns and curves inspired by nature and by natural shapes. It tends to have a lot of embellishment and adornment, and you can really see this in the example on the right. Now this building to the left, affectionately called the Ice Cream Cone Building, is built by Antoni Gaudi, and he's a very famous architect of the period. Although it appears to be molded, it's actually made of cut stone, and it's supposed to appear as a natural form. Now, to the right is an Art Nouveau interior, and you, you've probably seen these kind of designs uh, in jewelry. There's a certain kind of style of art, and a whole line of craft that comes from Art Nouveau it tends to have a lot of patterning and scroll work. These two images both reflect Art Nouveau influences. To the left is an artist by the, is a drawing by the artist Aubrey Beardsley. And he was the guy who was sort of inspired Art Nouveau. This was done in 1894. 
Here you can see the influence of Japanese prints because that was all the rage at the time when you look at the patterning and the simplicity of the design. Um, it's more stylized. He's moving ever further away from realism. Now, Aubrey Beardsley died at the age of 26, but he's seen as a very strong influence uh, for the Art Nouveau style. Now, The Kiss by Gustav Klimt was painted about 15 years later. This artist has a very unique way of blending patterning and realism to create very strong emotional pieces. Now, Gustav Klimt's work is very interesting to me because what this artist does is you can see in some of his work fine academic rendering, like the guy could paint it to look real. But then, as it moves away from the focal point, he goes ever more into patterning. And I, include, I um, encourage you to look up his work online and to look at the great variety of his work. Another thing about Klimt is that he did use a lot of gold leaf in his work, and you can see that here. So that would be thin sheets of gold that are applied in certain places to the work. Now, as an artist who's worked with gold leaf, I'll tell you that you have to really be careful how you use it, or it comes off looking distracting or gaudy. And that's one thing that um, Gustav Klimt did very well. So let's go a little bit more into fantasy. So first off, Henri Rousseau, and that's the painting above on the right. He's got an interesting story because he was a customs official. You know, just a government official, kind of a mediocre job, and he wasn't trained in art at all. He began painting in middle age, probably when he was a lot older than a lot of you who are listening. His primitive style and images were based on dreams, and they strongly influenced Picasso and surrealist artists such as Salvador Dali. He sort of foretold the, surre the school of surrealism that would come later. And when you look at this, <clears throat> you can think that he's not really modeling it after anybody. He's, that's just coming from him, from his dreams. All of these artists um, sought to explore the unconscious parts of the mind. This was at the time of Sigmund Freud and psychoanalysis, and everything from the unconscious was very interesting in popular culture. Now, um, the artist Marc Chagall is another one who sought to explore the unconscious mind. He was a Russian Jew, and he immigrated from Russia just before the First World War. And in this painting, I and the Village, he recreates scenes from his early childhood in Russia, and he adds scenes from folk tales and symbols from his unconscious mind. Now, I'll tell you, I'll be honest, I never really appreciated Marc Chagall. And then recently, I was at the Crystal Bridges Museum of Art, and I saw the show that was called um, Impressionism to, I think it was Van Gogh to Rothko, and I saw a couple of Chagall originals. And since then, I've seen some prints, some artist reproductions of Chagall's. And I've come to see him as truly a master because what he's doing is he's exploring the world that we can't really express in our mind and he's creating images from that. And now I've, I've kind of changed my point of view and really appreciate this artist. Now this guy's really interesting and I, again at that same exhibition at Crystal Bridges they had a work of his. And that's Giorgio Cherico. And this painting was painted in Paris in 1914. And that date is important. It's entitled Mystery and Melancholy of a Street. And it's kind of a mysterious work. If you look closely, look at that kind of menacing shadow in the background. And look at the open, um, empty trailer. And the little girl playing, but you kind of might worry for her a little bit. Well, this was created just before World War I. And we can see this premonition of danger in this image and in several other of his paintings. He could not explain the meaning of this, of any of it, of the empty moving van, the girl running, or the ominous shadow. And what's interesting is that after the war, uh, Giorgio Cherico returned to Italy and he dismissed this earlier work as if he was embarrassed by it. And he returned to painting in a more conservative style. Now what's interesting to me about this artist is he actually did several of these pieces right before World War I and you can feel the tension brewing in his work. But then again after the war 
it was like he didn't want to claim responsibility for it. He just said, oh, that's silly stuff. But really, it was very powerful work, and it influenced the Surrealist movement that would develop in the 1920s. Oh, did somebody say Surrealist movement? Why, look, here we are. As World War, first let's start with Dada. And the Dadas is, are so interesting. And before you get it, we get into it, let me just tell you that they lived to be offensive. Okay, but there's a reason behind that, and it's a good reason. As World War I came to a close, these young artists began to question the very fundamentals of what art was. And the, a group of these guys, and they were all guys, became Dadaists. And what Dada means is like baby talk. Da, 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 da. And what the Dadaists did was they wanted to push society's limits. And what you have to remember here, imagine a group of young men, age say, I don't know, 18 to 30, that came of age during World War I, this incredibly brutal war. They saw the villages that they loved bombed. They had friends or they went through the trenches, the gas, and then the influenza epidemic, which killed literally millions of people. So these young men had come through this time and it caused them to look at the standards from before the war and say, oh, that's just a crock. They didn't believe it anymore. So they looked at the rules around art and they wanted to set it on its head. So one of the most famous Dadaist sculptures is by Marcel Duchamp. And of course, you would all probably find it offensive. It was in a very prestigious art gallery and it was a urinal, a urinal, a porcelain, you know, urinal. And uh, he wrote in like nail polish, R. Mutt, on the side of it, and he put it out as art. Of course, people were just outraged at the time. And really, there is still some Dada work today, but what happened is the Dadaists got older and they became the Surrealists. Um, what the Surrealists did, now let's just stop and say something that you need to remember. Okay, I'll say it, you listen. Who influenced the Surrealists? The psychoanalytical writing of Sigmund Freud. Here's what you need to remember. Sigmund Freud strongly influenced, influenced the Surrealist artists. Got that? Psychoanalysis was founded by Sigmund Freud, and this explored the unconscious mind, and it really affected these artists as they sought to go deep into their unconscious minds to pull out their art. They would do automatic writing where you just sit and write and you cannot edit. And they wanted to create art that was, here I'll quote, free from the exercise of reason and from any aesthetic or moral pur purpose. So you think about these guys. Again, they came through World War I. They'd seen unspeakable horrors in their life. And they didn't want art that told a little morality lesson. They wanted art that went to a new place. And we got Salvador Dali, later Frida Kahlo, who was actually not a man. But um, the original Surrealists are, this is the origin of this work. Now here we have the persistence of memory, which is based on a dream. And you can see that. I've actually seen this piece. It's quite small. It's a beautiful painting. And on the right is a piece by Frida Kahlo. And she pretty much always painted self-portraits. And you know, her story is she was in a bus accident when she was 17. She was impaled head to toe with a rod. Not head to toe, from her torso, bottom of her torso, all the way up through her torso. And she had like 40 surgeries or something, and she died quite young. But after this time, she continued to just make these haunting self-portraits in a surrealist style. Another uh, really important surrealist who's actually one of my favorites is René Magritte. Now, he didn't go for deep, unconscious revelations. He just sought to represent the absurd. Like here we have uh, personal values on the right. You see the giant comb in the bed. I think there's a wine glass and a little shaving brush. Um, he sought to make these, these pieces of art that upset our view of how the world works. He wanted to kind of discredit ordinary reality and cause people to think in a new way. He called the world's mystery this thing that he was trying to portray. These are only a taste of the large body of delightfully absurd works that this guy created. And I encourage you to look up Rene Magritte online. You'll probably really 
uh, appreciate him. Okay, so we're going to go the opposite way with the Bauhaus School, but that will be in the next half of Modern One. Stay tuned. Thanks for listening.